Sorry, hello everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that, my microphone was muted. But welcome to another episode of the Discomfort Zone podcast. Um, I can see in the chat that not everyone is here yet, so we'll see if they uh, gather around, but I'll continue anyway as this is being uh, recorded for later previews as well. So, thank you for, jo for joining our Alien Honey. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again, and I have to say that I'm quite excited about this week's episode. It's a big one. I've been waiting for it for a while, and it's sort of been building up in my mind uh, over time, and there seemed to be quite a lot of information that had to uh, that I had to get through before we could actually arrive. But today, the subject of this episode, we're going to be talking about the flood. The Great Flood, the Deluge, which uh, I've mentioned previously. Um, but today we're going to go a bit deeper into it and understand what exactly happened and was going on. So, I'd like to start the episode, um, as often I do, with the biblical tale. Now, I am assuming that all of my listeners are at least somewhat familiar with it. Excuse me one moment. Sorry, got something in my throat. Um, I'm assuming that most of my listeners will be somewhat familiar with this story in general, but in case uh, some of you might have forgotten, let's uh, recap a little bit. Yes, the show has started. We're live. And thank you very much for joining. Mykos, is uh, anyone else? Oh, ah, I see. Um, okay. So as we know, uh, and if we'll look at the quote, I've actually prepared both the English and the Hebrew uh, for those who might be interested in the uh, original text as well. So I've put up the quote from the Bible from uh, Genesis, which is the opening verses, not the opening, but the opening chapter of the story of Nova, Noah. And it says, And the deity saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every desire of his heart's thoughts was only evil every day. And the deity repented that he had made man upon the earth, and his heart grieved. And the deity said, I will destroy the earthling who I'm, whom I have created off the face of the earth. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the deity. Now, this is uh, Sitchin's quote. And I'm not sure why, but he missed out part of uh, the verse where it says um, in the Hebrew, for those who can read, you can see, I will, uh, the daddy said, I will, um, sorry, I will destroy the earthling whom I've created off the face of the earth. From man to the beast, to the insects, to the birds of the sky. So this is an entire decimation of all living beings. And God very clearly groups man, uh, humans, earthlings, with these other beasts, with these other uh, animals and life forms that are on earth. So that is the sort of reasoning or the beginning, the opening setting that the Old Testament gives us. And then in the last... Um, verse, and again, uh, Sitchin didn't translate this. I actually couldn't find his translation for the verse, so I took just the translation from a Christian website. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the deity. <clears throat> Sorry. Which is, which is pretty much the, the, the translation that I would give for um, the Hebrew. So, here's the deity, God, who has decided to wipe out um, humans, mankind, the reasoning for which is that the human's heart's thoughts are only evil every day. And in his decision to do so, he, for some reason that we're not given, decides to wipe out all of these other life forms as well, um, and not including the fish, which in the past 
um, in the past chapters in Genesis, whenever we were talking about groupings of animals, there was always a section of the fish as well. Here it's quite uh, clearly missing. So, what's going on? There seems to be quite a big uh, paradox. And what happens? Ah, sorry, let me just <laughs> point out in chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, the show used to be about the eco village and uh, following the events of coronavirus and what's going on globally, I decided that this information was more pertinent, so it's taken a slight shift. You can hear about it in one of the episodes where I talk about the new format if you'd want to know more. So I'm sorry if there was a false advertising, not everything is still cleared up. I do apologize, I have something in my throat. Okay, so what's going on? God decides to wipe out humanity. And in the following verses, it explains how God then decides, because for some reason he found favor, uh, Noah found favor in God's eyes, um, he decides to go warn Noah that there's going to be this terrible flood that's going to destroy all of these living creatures. And he tells him that he has seven days to construct this ark that will save him and two of every animal, um, and he's instructed to do so immediately. So this story, obviously, through the ages we can see as well, um, has really baffled, and especially I think the skeptics found it rather easy to pierce holes in this quite ludicrous representation of what's going on. So what is going on? Well, in order to do that, in order to discover, um, as we have done so far, we should turn to the other flood myths from the other cultures that we see and compare and contrast and see what we can learn about each one. So let's start from the Mesopotamian um, story. And in that tale, <clears throat> the character's name, uh, Noah, the, the uh, hero of the story, is named Zeusudra. I'll, uh, I'll just type that up quickly in case somebody wants to look it up afterwards. Oh, I can see there's a lot going on in chat. I'm sorry, I will go to chat uh, occasionally throughout the show, but I might miss a few things here and there. But I try to catch up as we go along. So, <clears throat> the way I actually constructed this to begin with was the episode was supposed to be three parts. The first part being sort of the biblical story, and then the tales that we've heard through the years um, from different cultures. And then there's a big missing piece of the picture. But I think what I'm actually going to do is we're going to interweave those two. And so we're going to go through each of these tales and glean what we need uh, from each. And so we're going to continue from pretty much where we left off uh, last week. And uh, we'll have a quick recap in case you uh, weren't here. So the few things that were going on, there was the humans who were created in Eden and the whole relationship between them and Enki and Enlil. And eventually the Anunnaki grew very um, tired of waiting and it been, uh, sort of took the humans to work all over the land. And um, on the earth in that time, we said that there were uh, climatic changes that were taking place and the weather was becoming uh, more difficult to sustain the agriculture. So at this point, something very big happens and it concerns Marduk. And for those of you who remember, Marduk is the son of Enki. Now, Marduk at this point has had quite a difficult life and he is the firstborn of Enki. And as the others, he was sort of skipped over as well. And the uh, heir and rights and Engi's knowledge was passed on to his younger brother. And so what happens is that Marduk, after many disappointments in an attempt to seize control and to gain his what he considers birthright, he falls in love with a human uh, female whom he has got to know through his relationships with uh, Adapapa. She is actually a granddaughter of uh, Adapa. And he decides he wants to marry her. And so he goes and speaks with his father, who is Enki, and tells him that he's decided to marry this human uh, female. And Enki is tremendously upset uh, for many reasons, not least of which is that if Marduk were to do this, it would mean him giving up his uh, 
status as prince and his uh, regal bloodline and basically giving up his right, uh, his heir. Marduk, of course, laughs at this and says that he is not giving up anything that he doesn't have and that he was promised and he still hasn't gotten that right to lead and so he is willing to pay that price. Enlil, as we can assume, is obviously beside himself with uh, anger and enragement at this further development of the relationships, uh, the forbidden relationships between the Anunnaki and the humans. And eventually, word gets to Anu. Now, when Anu hears about Marduk wanting to marry the human feel, he takes his time and he consults with his uh, scientists and his advisors. And so what happens here is we find a piece of information that is rather crucial to the entirety of the Anunnaki's being here. It's something that the Anunnaki at this point don't know, those who are on Earth. But the scientists who are on Nibiru, who are obviously monitoring all of this and uh, continuing their research into both Earth and the Earth cycles and their effect on the Anunnaki, have come to the conclusion that biologically speaking, the Anunnaki who were born on Earth and even those who have stayed long enough um, cannot physically return to Nibiru because of the change in life cycles, because of the effect that staying on Earth has had on their biology, they are now physically incapable, they would become sick and they wouldn't be able to return to Nibiru. Now, not wanting to let the Anunnaki know about this terrible news uh, in order to avoid any kind of panic, Anu decides that the best way to treat this is as an opportunity. And he explained to Marduk that he would have to give up his princely rights and his uh, heir to the throne if he were to marry this female. But if he is willing to do that and to swear never to return to Nibiru, then he is free to do so. And so we see again this state where Anu, who is not on earth but very far removed, is actually intervening and usually the peacemaker between the two brothers, Enlil and Enki. And both the brothers are rather unhappy about this, but as uh, Anu is king and his, uh, his voice is the one that decides, they accept. And so a marriage is arranged. In fact, the first marriage between a human female and an Anunnaki, a royal Anunnaki at that. Um, okay, one moment, let me just go over chat because I can see a lot that has been going on and I'll see if there's anything that is uh, crucial to my attention. Um, oh, welcome Movement19. Thank you very much for joining. I can see yes, yes, yes. Uh Okay, so if you know all about this, then I'm trying to as, um, sort of present it in a way that's also open to people who've never heard about these things. So it might be a lot that you've already heard of, but I hope you get something out of it uh, as well. Um, okay, the constellations, how they map in the sky. I think we've been through several dark ages already. Well, I'm not going to talk about uh, constellations with Sitchin, although he talks about it as well, but we'll we'll get to that later. Okay, okay. So I think in chat, basically, you've been going over uh, the the yeah the the timelines and the stories and things that we haven't gotten to. So I'm not gonna. Um, there's nothing that demands my attention right now. Okay, so let's carry on. You can carry on in chat. That's excellent. I won't be uh, uh, commenting right now. So at this moment, when Marduk and uh, the human female decide to get married, um, I've mentioned another uh, being called the Ijiji. And for those who remember, they are sort of lesser um, sort of status than the Anunnaki. They're sort of a workforce. They're somewhat slaves. They're not animals. They are other sort of Anunnaki in terms of the race, but they are not part of the royal Anunnaki. They're the workforce. Uh, some of them were stationed on Mars, some of them were stationed in orbit around Earth. And in the beginning, they were the, the ones who were mining and who revolted against Enlil. Marduk has been their leader until now on Mars. And so when they hear that Marduk is going to get married, they decide to come and to celebrate. And they obviously they request and they're allowed. Um, but there is another reason that they want to come. And this is a secret reason that they don't mention to the Anunnaki before they arrive. But the Gigi are in a very difficult situation, as it were. 
if we can imagine for a moment, these are alien beings who are far removed from their home planet, and they are a slave workforce, meaning they have very little rights, and in terms of their uh, continuity and their familial life, they have very few options, if any at all. Since they're not allowed to intermarry with the Anunnaki uh, royalty, um, and then away from their home planet in Nibiru, they don't have many options. So when they discover, when they hear about Marduk, who has been allowed by Anu to marry the human female, they figure, why not us? And so they decide um, to secretly devise this plan in which they will come to Earth and after the wedding, so as obviously not to spoil their leader's uh, special day, um, they plan to basically abduct and take of the uh, human female's wives for themselves to have. And so this is indeed what happens on the day of the marriage. Everything goes smoothly and everyone's very uh, happy and celebrating. And at the end of it, um, around, I, I can't remember, but a few hundred Ijiji uh, take uh, human females and sort of escape to one of the Anunnaki bases in the area and held up there and uh, stated their demands that they should be allowed to marry these uh, females and why is it that Marduk is allowed to and not them since they can't actually have families. So this is a very dire situation obviously and at this point um, the Anunnaki and Enlil especially are really furious as is expected and they turn to Marduk and tell him that since he is their leader they will listen to you, go and solve this crisis, go and deal with it. But Marduk turns to them and says if I'm the one you want me to, if I'm the one you want to deal with this, then I have to tell you I'm siding with the Ijiji. Um, I agree, why shouldn't they be allowed to, and if I'm allowed to, and uh, since they have no other option, um, if you ask me, I think they have every right to. So at this point, Enlil has really lost it, because if we recall, this has been sort of a deteriorating situation in his eyes from the original sin, uh, for him, which was the creation of this work beast, um, all the way down until Enki first slept with a human f female, until now when Marduk, a royal uh, Anunnaki, wants to marry her, and now all hell is broken loose, and everyone, all the Anunnaki are basically seeing, following suit, and soon uh, this will be something acceptable. So Enlil is enraged, and he, in his fury, uh, sort of agrees and banishes uh, Marduk and the Ijiji, telling them they can't stay in uh, where he is, in uh, Mesopotamia. And he goes away. And at this point in the story, the, uh, the stories converge, the Old Testament and basically Sitchin's writings. Um, Enlil gathers the rest of the Anunnaki council in a uh, secret meeting and he swears them all to oath and decides as the commander that uh, the Anunnaki should wipe out the human beings once and for all and uh, sort of clean up this mess as is. And he obviously says this is a following... This is actually following a worsening state of the uh, climate and ter terrible famines and diseases that are um, sweeping through the lands. And the humans are suffering very much, the Anunnaki as well as there's less food, but the humans are actually becoming uh, more animalistic in this state of survival. And there is a, a clear deterioration in this situation. And following this, Enlil says to end their suffering, this isn't working, to wipe them out once and for all. And so the 12 members of the Anunnaki uh, council agree to uh, Enlil's bidding and swear to secrecy to not divulge. So this is the situation at the moment. And if uh, I may share another quote, I would like to... So uh, what I've been talking about until now, basically, was really taken mostly out of the Lost Book of Enki, which last episode was uh, also uh, very much taken from. Um, 
This quote is actually not from the book of Enki, but instead it's from, oh, I have to remember, I'm pretty sure it's from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a Mesopotamian uh, old tale that was found on a uh, clay tablet, and it was discovered relatively recently. I, I can't actually remember when exactly it was. Um, so this is a quote from that, and this quote basically shows Enlil's, um, you know, as it were, thoughts about humans and about uh, what, what, how he thought of them and what should be done. So here, let me post it right now. Oh, hang on, I apologize. I thought I had it and I don't. Okay. Um, sorry about this, one moment. Let's see. Ah, shoot, I have both quotes. Yeah, let me do this one, okay. Okay, in those days, the world teemed. The people multiplied, the world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamor. Enlil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the babble. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. And again, we see the way that Enlil was thinking about humanity was more was closer to pests than, uh, than anything else, and the decision to exterminate them seems to come rather quickly, although we can see the events that uh, led to it were quite, ex quite extreme as well. So, at this point, uh, there is another crucial event that happens that seems small at the time, but has radical effects in the end. Um, there is a leader, a king at the time, called Lamech, and he has a very beautiful wife. And uh, following the events that we talked about, uh, Enki notices, as it were, uh, Lamech's wife and uh, approaches her in secret and uh, has his way with her and she bears a son. And when the son is born, uh, Lamech and the others notice very clearly that he is very light-skinned, very light-haired with blue eyes and uh, smooth. This was obviously very uncommon in those days, and Lamech goes to his grandfather to consult with him and asks what it is. And his grandfather suggests that probably what happened was that one of the Ijiji uh, had been with his wife. And if this son is born, this is a sign, because again, although the Ijiji were lesser beings for us, in the human eyes they were still obviously closer to the Anunnaki than anything else biologically. And so a son is born and he's named, uh, actually in this story, he's named Ziusudra, as we said before. Now, if we jump forward to when Enlil and the council decide to uh, exterminate the humankind, we find Enki in a bit of a dilemma. Now, I'm going to jump forward a bit in time. And we're going to get back to this point because it's crucial for what's happening next. Now, I mentioned the Epic of Gilgamesh. For those who uh, have never heard of it, it's the tale of Gilgamesh, who was a king, who was sort of biologically one-third of the Anunnaki, so a sort of demigod. And he realized that thanks to his lineage, he was entitled to eternal life. And he sets off on a very long and detailed quest um, in order to attain this uh, long life, longevity. And as part of his quest, he hears about a man who is named uh, Utnapishtim. That's his name. Uh, and he is said to have uh, walked with God and attained eternal life. And Gilgamesh discovers where he is uh, staying, and he finally, after a long and arduous journey, manages to reach him. Now, this story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, comes to us on a clay tablet, and it's the only copy that we have found. So, the importance of this story to humanity, to understanding, is uh, un unbelievable. And I would like to take a moment just to, again, accentuate the fact that so little of this information has managed to survive until today for us to read it. And if there are these little tidbits that we managed to get to hold of, 
they are very, very important because of their scarcity. Because in this specific uh, epic, Utnapishtim reveals a secret to Gilgamesh and a secret that probably would never have reached uh, humans' ears uh, had it not been for this encounter. Because Utnapishtim witnessed what was happening behind the scenes as well to give us the entirety of the story. And so... As we know, there were the climactic changes that were happening. This was actually occurring because, as the scientists uh, discovered, um, the planet of Nibiru was closing, uh, getting closer to its position to where Earth is. It's Beverly basically coming um, closer to its point in the solar system. And thanks to that proximity, the effects of the giant planet on Earth were increasing. And so these effects that were increasing were wreaking havoc both on Earth and indeed on Mars. Now, according to the tale, and I'm not going to say that I uh, have seen conclusive evidence of this, um, of all of the things that I've talked about, this one I do feel the need to warn that I'm not entirely convinced as of yet, because I haven't seen, as I said, but... Um, as Sitchin describes it, Mars was with an atmosphere at this point. And it was actually after the calamity and the passing of Nibiru through the solar system that the atmosphere was lost on Mars and became inhospitable. Um, but before then, it was actually with an atmosphere as well. So at this point in time, uh, the Anunnaki uh, understand that Nibiru is coming to Earth, and with this coming, all of the uh, ice that's been trapped, the water that's basically trapped in the ice um, glaciers, is going to be sh shaken loose by this effect of the gravity, and will result in this uh, global flood that will basically affect all life on Earth. And so, as the stories are told, and we see again an example of the Anunnaki uh, manipulating their followers and their believers, the stories that are told are that the gods decided to exterminate, to kill uh, humans. But the fact of the matter seems to be that there was this giant flood approaching, and the decision was to keep it a secret from uh, the human beings. And so Enki, as the others, swore to uh, on oath to keep it, and for the Anunnaki, for the royalty, obviously, uh, this swearing was something that I, I'm pretty sure was a penalty by death, if I'm not mistaken, but definitely a very uh, grievous act. And we are told, in fact, uh, by Enki's own words, that that night he had a dream, and in that dream a figure approached him. And this figure told him, that um, the flood is coming and it is an act of the universe and Enlil's doing is acceptable but that it is Enki, his role to save this uh, one person who was Utnapishtimzi Usudra Noah and he must not break his oath of the Anunnaki but he must take these plans and he was shown a clay tablet with the uh, plans for building an ark and instruct uh, Ziusudra to construct it. And so Enki awakes in alarm from his dream and looks beside his bed and lo and behold he sees the clay tablets with the plans right there. So as the story goes, Enki at this point is convinced obviously of the validity and uh, decides to carry out his task and the way he gets around it, and this is what's told in the Epic of Gilgamesh, when Utnapishtim is telling Gilgamesh how this happened to him, Enki approaches his... Uh, he was living in a reed hut by the river, and Enki approaches the reed hut where he's sleeping, and he speaks to the reed hut, and says, reed hut, reed hut, wake up and listen to these words. And so <laughs> that is his uh, trick for getting out of the oath by divulging his plans to the reed hut, uh, the other side of which is Noah, who is listening very carefully. And so 
in the tale and in uh, the retelling of Utnapishtim, we're told that uh, he will be given a sign at what point to enter the ark. When, how will he know uh, when to do so? And he's told that he will be given a sign that when he sees Shamash, who was one of the Anunnaki, uh, uh, lighting up the fire, uh, lighting up the sky with the fires, that will be the time for him to go in. And so this is obviously not understood by Utnapishtim or the biblical people, but as Sitchin reiterates it rather clearly, this was the moment where the Anunnaki uh, entered their spaceships to leave Earth and uh, enter orbit, uh, waiting for the catastrophe to uh, pass over, as it were. So we have one more issue that we have to tackle, and that is the animals two by two. Um, I will, um, okay, let me just go over chat because I can see that there's one question from Mykos. Uh, yes, the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, Enki is described in the book of Enosh. Enki, uh, Enki is described in many different places and he has many different names. Um, Sitchin's work and my preference is looking through the different texts and as this podcast will continue we're going to be tracing these gods tracing uh, the figure of Enki through different cultures uh, throughout time eventually leading us to uh, modern times as well but yes this uh, these stories as we see were told and retold throughout different cultures the story of the flood was retold in cultures in South America as well but we'll get to that in the in a moment. Um, okay, so basically, um, as I'm sure some of you have either either know or have guessed, and others have probably heard, when we're told about these animals by two or two of every animal, um, for Enki, who was instructed to do so uh, in his dream, um, this is clearly a collection of samples, DNA samples which we are told previously that the Anunnaki had been collecting, um, as would be expected of a group of alien astronaut scientists who landed on a unknown planet. Um, they were scanning it for a long time, and they were scanning the different organisms and collecting uh, samples of the, the different organisms, and assuming with what we know about genetic engineering from the story of the creation of human beings, and what we obviously know uh, today of our own genetic engineering and how advanced it is, printing you know biological organs, etc. Um, it's safe to assume that having the genetic uh, imprint the DNA would be suffice uh, to repopulate one way or another. But that is the description that we're given by Sitchin as to the collection of all of the animals of two by two into the ark and storing them all there, etc. So it's just a nice little sort of <laughs> nugget of what on earth does it mean that male and female, they entered two by two, etc., etc. Uh, how can you get all the animals in the world onto one ark. So the flood came and Noah's Yosudra Utnapishtim uh, was in the ark for the entirety of it. In terms of the period of time that it lasted, we are told in the Bible that it was 40, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but we're not actually told, I think, I can't remember how long from entering the ark until exiting because once the waters receded there was still a long time that they were sorry once the rain stopped there was still a long time before the waters receded enough to be able to leave but um ah in terms of the ark from the descriptions and what we're told it seems to be a submersible uh, so I'm not sure if the boat would be as close because they uh, talk about it as a, a uh, mode of transportation that will be able to be underwater as well. And we are told in this instance that um, along with uh, Noah and his family, Enki sends, uh, in fact, I think it's Dumuzi, one of his sons, to accompany Noah in the ark, both to be able to... Uh, navigate, which is obviously a skill that Noah didn't have, and for the technical know-how of actually sustaining that. So, 
as to the validity, the measurements, the materials, the technology, there isn't much that's told. As usual, we are trying to sort of reverse engineer from archaic descriptions of a culture who didn't technologically understand what they were describing and then trying to understand uh, what equivalent we have today in our technology that might be similar. So it's a very <laughs> difficult job and I'm certainly not uh, guaranteeing 100% accuracy in everything. What we know is that they had very advanced technology how advanced, what it was, you know, how it worked, et cetera, et cetera, hard to say, but the evidence that I've seen clearly suggests that, you know, for example, a civilization who could construct the pyramid was using some very advanced technology one way or another. Um, and uh, same goes for, you know, um, Stonehenge and, uh, you know, in um, South America, et cetera, et cetera. So... <clears throat> The waters do recede finally, and the Noah's Ark uh, sort of they they leave uh, the ark and they come out. And in the Bible, we're told that they immediately offer uh, to the god a sacrifice. And in the Lost Book of Enki, in the story, basically in the Mesopotamian story, the Anunnaki land and come and sort of see. Um, the human beings who have survived because until this point that was actually a secret and this was why uh, Enki told them not to board the Ark until he was sure the Anunnaki had left for the spaceships so that they wouldn't be caught before and their plan would be ruined. So <clears throat> one small detail with another character that I will place here We've mentioned her before. She is the the goddess, and she was the um, sort of the mother goddess, the female Anunnaki who birthed the humans, uh, Enki's partner in the creation process. Her name is Ninma, and she was up in orbit with the rest of the Anunnaki in uh, different spaceships. And they were witnessing what was happening on Earth at this time, all of the calamity, all of the humans and all life being destroyed. And we're told, uh, it's described that she wept for her human creation and she regretted the decision of Enlil to wipe out humanity. And she, at that moment, shows uh, really sort of what could be described as motherly love for her creation. Um, you know, however lower level it may be, um, she wept and was inconsolable uh, by her other Anunnaki uh, family who were there. And so when she arrives on, um, on Earth, basically, after the calamity and sees that the humans have been saved, she is overjoyed. And the rest of the Anunnaki, witnessing the destruction and seeing just how dire the situation is, um, are obviously very, very happy to see that some humans survived who may be able to bear some of the work. But uh, then Enlil arrives. And after all that we've been through and everything that's uh, been trying to, you know, get done, he sees that there is this arc, obviously very advanced technology, and this human who has uh, managed to survive with his family, and he is again beside himself. He immediately knows that it's Enki's doing, and he goes and accuses him of breaking the oath. And at this point, uh, Enki does something very interesting. He, he half admits to the truth in saying that it was his doing, but he then immediately reiterates that he never broke the oath, which on a technicality uh, is true. But in Enki's words, he was trying to explain to Enlil that the situation right now is that the human beings have been saved and this doing was not his own bidding, but he was instructed to do so by the higher beings who came to him in a dream. And while Enki is explaining all of this, um, reports have started coming in from around the earth that the Anunnaki have been scanning. Uh, informing that there are other groups of humans who have survived. And it's at this point 
that there's another turning point basically the mines the gold mines that were used in Africa until this point uh, shipping gold to Nibiru which is really the only reason that the Anunnaki were there originally um, have been completely uh, sealed up with the mud from the flood and so now there's no way to access the gold but these reports that have been coming tell that next to these humans in the mountains there have been these gashes opened up in the earth and these gold mines are pouring gold out uh, in sort of pure form no need to refine uh, no need to mine it's just laying there on the ground and so at that point Enlil who realizes both that uh, the, the humans were saved elsewhere in the world and that this sudden miracle which has saved them the gold has appeared uh, elsewhere on the planet um, he sort of realizes that this is the work of uh, greater beings than himself and at that point there's a slight shift or a change in his attitude towards humans so from this point forward um, the human beings, Noah specifically as the representative, are given Enlil's uh, blessing to procreate and to fill the earth as we, uh, as we know from the original text. And so this is again a very big turning point in the relationship between the humans and the Anunnaki. If until now uh, it was still clear that the human beings were nothing more than the animal workforce who were there basically to serve the Anunnaki in a very, on a very primitive level, in a very primitive way. At this point, there is a turning point. And in fact, Enki uh, presents uh, Noah, his son, not his son, sorry, his, yes, his son, his son, to Enlil and explains to him that he is a very unique individual among the humans whom he's taught and to be able to survive this calamity he is very capable and worthy and Enlil uh, agrees with Enki and they actually sort of I don't know what the term is but anoint him and his wife and claim him to be uh, more than a human and on that day they raise him uh, to the level of gods by that they mean giving him eternal life and it's uh, explained that he was taken to the place of the Anunnaki there was this forbidden land that humans couldn't get to and from there he was taken up to uh, live with God throughout his days so that's a very small tidbit about longevity I think it's the second time we've talked about it it's a subject that will come up time and time again uh, but I don't want to get into it too much for now what we're left with is the rebuilding of basically the, the, the whole establishment of the Anunnaki here on earth and so okay before I carry on let me just take a quick break because I can see that there has been a lot in chat as well have there been any questions let me have a look and see oh I'm sorry for, okay uh, da -da -da -da. <clears throat> Oh, Falcon, thank you very much for joining. Oh, even at work, I do appreciate it. Um, what the Ark was, was it just an actual boat? Oh, sorry, I'm not sure why I missed that uh, question. Ah, yes, 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 so he said. So, uh, Rondon said the Ark was a weapon. Now, we have again this problem of uh, double meaning. Well, I think, if I'm not mistaken, what you are talking about, the Ark is the Ark of the Covenant, if I'm not mistaken as correct me if i'm wrong but i think you mean the ark of the covenant which is the same word ark but a very different uh, ark and in fact uh, well basically the ark that we're talking about is what noah built the ark of the covenant was given to the israelites to carry the uh, two tablets the two stone tablets with the ten commandments uh, placed inside inside and there's a lot uh, to talk about the Ark of the Covenant and yeah, what it is, etc., etc. Uh, we'll 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 get into that in later chapters. But there's a lot of folklore as well, and a lot of uh, uh, interesting theories and uh, research done into the Ark of the Covenant uh, recently. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I see two sentences later, Mykos 
uh, corrected as well. Thank you very much. Sorry, I should read uh, down. Yes, Battlefield Earth, absolutely. Which, by the way, is a uh, is supposed to be sort of a um, uh, what do you call them? <gasps> the religion, the new religion that's now out. That's uh, John Travolta. Oh my gosh, I'm completely blank. Ron uh, L. Ron. Can't remember. Anyway, it's for the uh, for their organization, if I'm not mistaken, like this story is supposed to be. Um, okay, let me just read here a little bit. The idea that the Anunnaki wanted to create a slave race um, was made up by the reptilians who took over this planet. That's what the Masons teach in their lodges. Uh, George Bush, the reptiles. Yeah, where they'd come in. The Anunnaki had beef with the reptilians from the planet Murdoch because the way the story goes, Nibiru accidentally took out part of their planet. Uh, okay, so Movement 19, I, uh, first of all, I very much appreciate both your input and your knowledge. Um, I, I, you touch on a lot of interesting subjects. I definitely do not know everything or claim to know all of it. I, I do uh, believe that I know some of uh, what you are talking about. And from what I know, uh, the events that you're talking about actually take place uh, later in human history. And I will very quickly just mention that they actually take place, in my understanding, on a slightly different, uh, let's call it, plane of reality. And so I'm going to go into this much, much more before the next section, where I start talking about uh, Druval and Melchizedek. And that's a whole other story which is sort of parallel. So there are a lot of alien races, there are a lot of different names, there are a lot of different uh, sort of levels of beings of all of these things, and it can get a little bit confusing. So I'm going to try and make sense. In order to do that, it takes a long time to sort of slowly unfold it clearly and treat each section before we start putting it all together. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. But thank you very much. And if you stay with me uh, longer on, we are going to get into those subjects. Crimson Clad, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Scientology, absolutely. I'm so sorry. That's exactly uh, what I meant to say. Okay. Um, so let's carry on a little bit. We've got 13 minutes left. We've got through most of it. Okay. I actually had a little bit more, but I think we're going to carry on with it next week. Um, so let's just wrap things up very quickly for what we've got so far. At this point in time, I mentioned that there was another place where um, the Anunnaki have now, after the calamity, found gold, uh, in their words, bursting out of the ground. And this place is indeed in South America according to Sitchin's interpretations, obviously. So this is still all Sitchin's writings, I should say. There are other theories, but we're talking about him. And from his descriptions, they talk about a vast lake up in the mountains, um, and there are humans who are already living uh, there and around. And uh, the Anunnaki basically decide to reposition and uh, start a new sort of base of operations from what was in Africa to South America. And so this obviously changes quite a lot of things. First of all, we have the human beings who are now staying in uh, Mesopotamia and their relationship with the Anunnaki, which has been through certain developments. And we also have the cultures in South America, the humans in South America, who are sort of entering the beginning of a relationship with the Anunnaki at this point. So... We will finish up very quickly with Mesopotamia. As I mentioned previously, and this was something that was starting uh, before the flood in the first cities that were started, at this point there is again this shift and human beings are allowed to live as civilized uh, people in cities and the worshipping of the deities is both increased in its sort of uh, capacity and becomes more advanced. And so until now, there has been a lot of information that has been uh, kept from most humans. Certain individuals were allowed to learn certain techniques. But at this point, since uh, the Anunnaki are now sort of tasked with repopulating the earth in terms of the organism and sustenance as well as uh, the humans, so 
they decide to teach the human beings the secrets of agriculture. And in fact, in the story, we're told that they bring uh, some grains from Nibiru as well, specifically to plant and to introduce. And this begins the uh, agricultural and industrial almost life, not industrial in the modern sense, but the civilization stage of humanities. And the different cities were each designated to one of the Anunnaki gods. And that city was then worshipping that specific god. And that was where they had their temple, their home. And this opens up a new sort of um, era where now there are human beings who are divided into these different factions and each one of these factions represented by the gods is in some way in a sort of uh, you know let's say relationship with the other cities around relationship with the gods around and as we have seen and will see will continue to see the relationship between the gods can be quite tricky. Um, at times, indeed, uh, this starts this sort of whole period of warring states and warring gods and human beings being used as pawns in these uh, grasps at power moves made by the Anunnaki. So that's what we're going to be going into a little bit uh, in future. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I do want to sort of build it slowly and we'll get there. But what we are leading towards is a, another cataclysmic uh, event, which is less spoken about, that took place following these wars. And in my mind, I'm hoping um, that if we are continuing uh, as we are, that that will be the end of part one, this part about Sitchin's uh, sort of legacy and his theories. Now, having said that, um, we will be referring back to Sitchin time and time again, obviously, because we're seeing two stories that overlap and intertwine and sort of parallel each other. But we will be making a big shift and... So anyway, we'll get to that. Well, we won't go into it now too much. But that's what's been becoming. But next episode, we'll see exactly what it's going to be about. But we're going to start this period where human beings were living in the cities, worshipping the deities and beginning to... Conflicts were beginning to arise between the gods. So something to look forward to. Okay, let me just very quickly go over chat again and see... Uh, if there's anything crucial that I've missed. If you do, ah, you know what? I saw this in uh, someone else's YouTube. If you have a question for me specifically that you want answered, please uh, put it in caps and then it'll be easier for me to read as opposed to all the people giving this uh, information. Um, let's see. Ah, Crimson Cloud says, given what we were talking about, trying to decipher archaic language pertaining to future tech. I always just assume the Ark is holding a singularity or something. Um, well, I'll just say very quickly what I've heard about the Ark, let's say the most uh, evidence and the most interesting, is a small tribe in Ethiopia. I cannot remember the name of the tribe. I'm sure someone in chat will, who have an old man who is, I can't remember the name again of the duty but he is tasked for his entire life to guard uh, this cave and inside the cave they are they tell that there is this sort of you know crate uh, box about the size of the ark of the covenant and they're told that these not told but these uh, guards seem to always be suffering from radiation sickness um, a few generations back going you can see the the tales when they would uh, talk to them um, it's a job that they know that they sort of die at a young age and it's always this lineage of people who are tasked with uh, guarding it. So according to them, well, let's say that uh, when Sitchin talks about it as well, in the description, the Old Testament of how the Ark of the Covenant was constructed, it has the two the, the stone tablets inside and then an, a pure gold encasing gold uh, uh, sort of box and then around that 
another box of, uh, I think, wood that's painted with gold. I can't remember the exact description. But gold is also uh, a good insulator against uh, radiation leakage. And in the Old Testament, in the stories that we're told, whenever people touched the Ark of the Covenant or tried to open it or do these things, the descriptions are very often, uh, well, they're not <laughs> necessarily close to radioactive they more resemble sort of flashing and electricity or something but obviously people die very very quickly after coming into contact with it so whether it was also weaponized not just as holding a dangerous artifact but could actually direct that energy obviously that's possible we don't know we're told in one of the wars uh, with Moses I believe it was Joshua I can't remember, um, but that they were at war with the uh, Amalek and whenever they had the uh, covenant, when Moses would uh, raise his hands, they would win. When he lowered his hands, they would lose. And it was described that if this was indeed a weapon, uh, which was sort of massive or hard to handle, it could be that as they were using it, they would win. And when it was whatever, reloading too heavily, etc., uh, they would lose. So I don't know for sure. There certainly isn't enough evidence that I've seen to conclusively say what it is. It's certainly a very mysterious uh, artifact in terms of its uh, descriptions. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, as soon as you start getting into all of these different theories and things, um, it's it, it can become very hard to sift through it all. There's so much information out there. There's so many different theories from, you know, flat earth to hollow earth that for me personally, it's been very much, uh, it's been important to see the type of research as well. If we're just talking about a random page on the internet, you could probably find anything <laughs> that you want. Um, but for example, I read a very interesting book about the theory of uh, well, uh, the physics and electricity specifically, and it was written by a PhD, you know, a doctorate, and it was obviously completely denounced by all of the experts, but the arguments that he presented there made a lot of sense, and he made very clear and concise both calculations and uh, presentation of ideas. So that's that's for me a very important role. If I see, like, the people who I know who've talked about the Ark of the Covenant, uh, Sitchin, Graham Hancock, uh, I'm sure there are others I can't remember, um, they haven't offered any conclusive evidence that for them is, you know, very strong. There's obviously something going on there, as it were, but uh, they're not quite sure what it was. Um, okay, let's go on. I can see I've missed quite a few. I don't buy that other plane thing. Ah, there were physical beings just like us with a far higher intellect, intellect and technology. So, you're claiming that human beings are only on a physical uh, realm as well. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll agree uh, <laughs> to disagree for now. But if you would like to continue listening in the following uh, piece, where I'm actually going to be talking a lot more about what this other plane means, what the physical, non-physical can mean, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I'm certainly not going to convince you of anything that you, uh, you know, uh, whatever, disagree with or don't think. But if I can offer some arguments or ways of thinking that are new to you, I will feel that uh, my job is done and couldn't ask for, for any more. Um, ah, yeah, exactly. Well, if we're on a different plane and they are like us, then it would make sense. This is what Graham Hancock, uh, sorry, this is what Gerald Clark says, that when Enki designed the human beings, when he was designing the Anunnaki, he wasn't only manipulating the genetics, but as a scientist understanding the spiritual side of it, he was, uh, you know, interacting with the chakra system as well. Okay, that's it from me. That's all the time we have, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope to uh, see you all next time. Thank you very much. Bye.